Ambassador, thank you very much uh, for spending your almost all day <laughs> with our crew team. It will be very interesting for our viewers uh, uh, to listen to your answers about my questions, but in the same time to show uh, another part of your unofficial life. Mm. But of course, this interview will be more focused on the official and the very important political issues regarding uh, EU-Georgian relations. Uh, let's start from the first question. Uh, Georgia signed uh, uh, the association agreement and the, uh, the CFTA with the EU, received a visa-free uh, travel option in the, uh, the Schengen area and secured itself uh, as one of the leading partners with uh, the Eastern Partnership. Uh, quite an achievement, I would say, but all these we uh, uh, taught and planned in the previous decade. Uh, my question is this, what has been uh, planned in the Brussels and in Tbilisi during the previous years uh, that could bring some uh, new achievements in the coming decade? What do you think the next step in Georgia-EU relations should be and do you see a European perspective for Georgia in the short, medium uh, or long term? Well, thank you, Georgi. Uh, a very complex and very relevant question. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, I would fully agree with you that the association agreement and the visa free were really uh, landmark achievements. Uh, the big difference between those two, however, to my mind, uh, is that uh, the visa free regime, when it was ratified and entered into force, that's when everyone could use it. Uh, whereas the association agreement, once that entered into force, basically nothing changed immediately. And it's a bit like going to a bookstore and buy a cookbook. In this case, a cookbook that contains 740 pages, all in all, which is what the association agreement is. But it's only once you start using these recipes and you start cooking and serving the dishes that things happen. And this is what uh, this government has been uh, doing so well over the past years and has led to uh, a lot of praise and admiration from, from Brussels by advancing on the different reforms necessary. Uh, but I think this, is, this will remain the cookbook for some time. It's going to be very important to continue uh, cooking through the different recipes, if you'd like, in the coming years. And through that, step by step, there will also be deliverables that will be seen more and more. And I hope for more and more people here in Georgia also over time. Uh, so I think one, one, one should remain with this. And one should look for the possibilities of uh, tangible results through that. At the same time, I fully agree with you um, that uh, it's also useful to motivate people, including to uh, do reforms, to have some guiding lights. And, and to me, I think the visa liberalization policy was an excellent example. Uh, I also think that Erasmus Plus and these type of initiatives, both of them are putting, bringing people together and giving opportunities for closer contacts between Georgians and, uh, uh, and the citizens from the European Union. And I hope that we can use uh, the momentum we're having now in view of the next uh, Eastern Partnership Summit, which, as you know, will happen in the beginning of next year. The work and preparations will be done uh, during the autumn to find these uh, highlights, the guiding lights that can bring us further. And to my mind, I hope that those will be in the realm of something that is tangible for people and not uh, something that is too distance for, from uh, ordinary people's lives. The next question, uh, which will be more focused on our internal political problems and the issues, uh, you were one of the uh, mediators who brokered the 8 March agreement. What was exactly your role? And uh, if the electoral system is changed as agreed, uh, but Mr. Rurua is not released from prison, would you consider the agreement fully implemented? And would you say that it still serves its another purpose, which is to reduce the polarization and the tension between the uh, ruling party and the opposition in the run-up to the general elections? I took a decision um, 
after uh, the events of 14th November uh, to offer the services to become one of the facilitators uh, of this dialogue. And basically what it means uh, is um, um, to, to present to both sides the opportunity for a neutral ground in which to have these uh, conversations and to play a role as a listener, one of those who were trying to draw conclusions and in between those dialogue meetings also reaching out to both sides in trying to, to form the agenda that would lead the dialogue to move forward. And I think it was a very, very positive experience. Um, and that's why, despite the fact that in media, during the, the weeks of this dialogue, sometimes the, the verdict from the different sides was very, very negative, I could sense that despite these public statements, behind it all was a, a growing consensus, which in the end uh, proved to be correct. Um, and I think on the 8th of March, when we had all uh, major political parties sitting together, uh, around a common project, uh, I think that was an historic achievement um, for them. And I hope now that this historic achievement will continuously be nurtured. We're coming very close now to the end game when it comes to getting the constitutional amendments in place and uh, having that as broad-based as possible. And that means that all sides, everyone who has signed up to this agreement needs to step up and play their role uh, in order to make sure that we're seeing this coming to uh, its full fruition. And moreover, I would say that the constitutional amendments, as has been agreed back on the 8th of March, in, in themselves, to my mind, is a positive step systemically uh, for bringing about a system that will have less of polarization built into it. So these, these, uh, these amendments are truly important and I hope in the end we will have uh, uh, a, a broad-based um, consensus around their implementation that I believe will set this country on a good path towards the, the upcoming elections. Not that polarization will disappear even in that scenario, uh, but just to say that I think that will be an important uh, platform on which to build uh, the, the future election campaigns. It means that uh, the EU will have a more uh, strong focus about the pre-election story of Georgian elections, of course not uh, just the focus on election day. I mean the observers, uh, um, our partners from our political parties, from uh, EU Parliament or, and uh, EU structures. It will be very interesting and important for intended players always to fill some eyes uh, who is monitoring the situation on the ground. Yeah, no, those eyes will be there keenly watching because as we know elections uh, as they say, democracy is not only about elections, and elections is not only about the election day. It's really the, the, the process leading up to these elections, including the election day, um, on which we will follow very closely from our side. Answering in the first question, you mentioned that uh, you will do more and more uh, to give the feeling the ordinary people uh, the consequences uh, from the uh, Georgian EU relationship. And uh, the one of the best um, opportunity of that is to make more closure our societies. Uh, but coronavirus pandemic unfortunately created the problems in these directions. The next question is focused on this issue. What is your assessment of the impact of, of uh, the COVID-18 on the European economy? as well as on the Georgian economy. Do you think this crisis uh, can serve as an opportunity for Georgia to get integrated into EU economy more closely? Or what Georgia should do to become a part of the corona-free tourism zone or a corridor that the EU is working actively on? As you repeatedly mentioned yourself, Georgia is a rather a safe place and handled the corona crisis uh, relatively well. Yeah, no, indeed. Uh, well, first, when it comes to the, the economic impact, I think right now the latest uh, uh, predictions when it comes to the EU economy is that it will, will, um, 
will go down by some 7.4%, uh, which as compared to Georgia is is a worse scenario because as we know the current predictions is a minus 4 or minus 5% uh, contraction of the economy. But of course for Georgia uh, and for many Georgians uh, having such, such a contraction will be uh, making many people vulnerable here for sure. And that's why we have also uh, stepped up from day one from the European Union side and from Team Europe together with our member states uh, to do our bit also in assisting uh, the Georgian uh, both health crisis and also the recovery plan and we will continue to do that. Um, when it comes to uh, opportunities from crisis I think this is really an important uh, point to be made because I think in every crisis one needs to look for those opportunities uh, and uh, in the European Union um, basically the opportunities that uh, Brussels is trying to, uh, to seize with this crisis is to make a bigger push for our priority on the green agenda, so climate change and the environment, and also on digitalization of uh, society and our economy. It's a way of uh, pushing a further modernization of economic agenda. I think for Georgia, both of these priorities are very interesting. Um, as we know, uh, I'm very happy to see the environmental agenda growing on, on the public agenda in general. I think this is absolutely the right thing, not only for health reasons, but also for issues such as energy security and for attracting uh, an ever-growing mass of tourism over time. Uh, and digitalization has many components. It's about making uh, the economy modern and fit for uh, competing on the global markets. But it's also a way of um, uh, eradicating the, the, the gap between rural and urban areas, giving more possibilities out in Georgia's regions. So I hope that we can tap into these priorities on the European Union side and also have Georgia profit from them. But of course, there are many other opportunities to be seized uh, and uh, I will be very keen to, to continue having those discussions uh, here in Georgia with the government and with others about seeing what are the possibilities. Now, finally, on tourism, uh, as you mentioned, I, I said early on in this, this crisis uh, that I could not find a better place to be than here in Georgia. And uh, I, I remain firm on, on that opinion because uh, Georgia has clearly done very well when it comes to handling the health crisis. I saw this morning um, a study basically showing that Georgia has done better than anyone uh, when it comes to the number of cases per capita uh, compared to anyone on the European continent. And that's quite an achievement. Of course, the big thing is going to be uh, of getting those tourists in time. And I see the challenges there because, as we know, summer has begun. The clock is ticking and uh, it's not only in the hands of Georgia uh, how to attract tourists here, uh, and I see Georgia as an attraction point, but it also depends on the health situation, the airliners' priorities and so on. And uh, so it's going to be a tough, a tough couple of weeks and months in order to make that happen. Not less as uh, we know in Georgia that Georgia alone will, will not sur survive this process, I mean, particularly in the economical and the social sphere, that you already allocated uh, a sizable amount of uh, assistance to Georgia to overcome the corona crisis and to help Georgia businesses and economy in the post-corona period, uh, which is indeed great. Are there any other ways apart from the financial assistance that you could help the leading uh, EAP countries? Well, first of all, to say, well, thank you uh, for your kind words. I'm, I must say I am very proud of the fact that we managed in these last couple of weeks to muster the amount of assistance that we have for Georgia. Uh, in total, we're talking about some 1.5 billion laris uh, in, in overall assistance, where more than or almost two thirds 
is in the form of grants and the la la last part in, in form of loans. Uh, and we have acted very rapidly and actually Georgia is in terms of assistance per capita one of the, the, the biggest recipients of the European Union globally. Um, and it's well deserved, uh, both because of the handling, the, the plan when it came to the health crisis, but also the, the very rapid engagement from the side of different parts of the authorities with regard to discussions about the economic recovery plans, and we have been engaging in that. Um, and um, so that's a good starting point. Um, when it comes to priorities, um, um, having a focus on the macro financial stability is obviously important and we are there to do that. When it comes to businesses, we are trying uh, alongside the government to inject money, more money into small and medium sized enterprises, which is the backbone of the economy here. And uh, of course, small and medium sized enterprises are particularly vulnerable to a lockdown, as we have seen now in the last couple of weeks. That's important for social well, stability also and for our political stability. Absolutely. And in the end, we have to get that part of the equation going as soon as possible because that's the way also to solve some of the other uh, issues. But apart from that, we have also had two other focuses from the start. Uh, one has been on the health situation as such. And uh, I hope now uh, that in the coming days or before the end of the month, we will be able to come with another shipment uh, that we are uh, preparing together with the World Health Organization, which will come with uh, uh, medical equipment, uh, masks and so on, that can either be used uh, in the current situation or prepare Georgia for a possible uh, second wave when that will come and so on. And then the third focus from our side has always been on vulnerable groups because as we know, everyone is hit uh, by this crisis, but there are those who are hit harder than others. Uh, and it's important not to leave them alone. And uh, again, we are working uh, together with the government, but also together with civil society and, uh, and the opposition, others who are reaching out and trying to make sure that uh, this country is not leaving anyone behind. And just last week, I launched uh, three new product, projects, uh, one on, uh, on, uh, on um, people with disabilities, uh, another one on victims of uh, domestic violence, and the third one on IDPs, which is obviously three groups that uh, have been particularly hit by this crisis. And I think keeping that focus is also going to be important for the overall recovery. Say again many thanks for our part because in these kind of difficult and crisis situations always are more better viewed and understand who are our real friends. So you as always is a, the keeping the leading position in this status. So thank you very much again. And the next issue is that mm, the EU M uh, MM is the only observer mission uh, at the ABL. It is indeed very important and uh, we are extremely grateful for it. Uh, I'm uh, interested in how long uh, term the mission is and if the corona crisis that could generate the economic crisis in the EU can possibly affect its longevity. Uh, also what the EU is doing with Russia to give the EU MM a chance to fully implement its mission on the both sides of the ABL, which was supposed to be the format of the UM, uh, according uh, to the Six Point Agreement. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have the UMM here, uh, because as you say, it is the only mission, it's not only the only eyes and ears for us as the European Union, but it's playing that role for the whole international community. So it's truly crucial. Um, the good news is that it's also very much recognized among our member states. Uh, I should say that um, today, at this moment, 25 out of our 27 member states have personnel in that mission. And that's rather extraordinary if you're looking at and com compare it to other missions that the EU is doing 
around the world to have 25 out of 27 member states willing to commit their people uh, to a mission uh, makes this an extraordinary success. Um, when it comes to the mandate uh, renewal, the next time it will uh, be discussed is going to be at the end of this year. Uh, I am absolutely uh, convinced that uh, financial restrictions, uh, hardships, what have you, from the corona crisis uh, will not have uh, a negative impact when it comes to uh, prolonging this mission. Uh, I think this mission will be here as long as it's needed and it's necessary and that as long as it can play its role. Um, when it comes to, uh, to the mandate of, of the UMMM, you, you're mentioning um, uh, the, the movement of EUMM on both sides of the ABL. This is something that we, we keep, uh, keep discussing. Uh, with Russia and others that we would like to see the full implementation of the 2008 agreement which has implications both for EUMM's movements but also when it comes to uh, human rights monitoring and humanitarian and other access and this will remain uh, our, our goal. Something that my colleague the USR is pushing in Geneva talks and uh, Brussels and others are doing in bilateral contexts. Uh, Ambassador, um, linking uh, this small question on your answer, uh, in, in internal political debate in Georgia, uh, the critics from opposite side, I mean political opposition or NGOs, are criticizing Georgian government not to be enough active in the national uh, uh, sphere to push the Russia to implement, for, uh, for, for example, this uh, uh, agreement after war. Uh, so do you think that the Georgian government's activity is enough? Uh, or uh, they are doing something which is not enough to influence on Russian behavior? The way we are working together very closely with this government is, has basically two dimensions to it. One is to continuously be vigilant when it comes to the security aspects, everything that is going on around the ABL, the humanitarian situation, uh, the suffering we're seeing uh, on both sides. Uh, the other one is the engagement policy uh, that we also think is very important, trying to find ways of engaging and uh, making sure that, uh, that uh, over time uh, the connections are not being lost, but that some opportunities from that will be seized as, as is possible. Uh, and, uh, and we believe that this is the approach that over time hopefully will bring, bring the results. Um, I think the Georgian government has been very active when it comes to um, raising uh, or trying to rise this conflict on the international agenda. Um, but um, there, there are some objective difficulties in doing that um, and, and try to break what everyone wants, to break the deadlock and, and get uh, a new momentum. But it's something that we, we all have uh, a stake in, we all have to be engaged in and we'll have to continue looking for those openings and those possibilities. Thank you. And last uh, question. You have been in Georgia already for some uh, time and got to know its political landscape, which is very complicated, and it was always very complicated, and people well enough. Uh, in your day. Uh, yes, uh, was a very clever man, uh, um, also ambassador from the Western countries, told me in interview that uh, you as a nation exactly know what you do not want, but still have no clear idea what you want. So my question to you is, if you have kind of a similar or different feeling about Georgian people, do you think they fully understand or realize what the European values truly are, even though all polls show that the overwhelming majority of the population uh, favors the EU? I am absolutely convinced that a former colleague of mine was a clever man. Uh, but I would take a bit of an issue uh, if linked to uh, the Georgian population's 
um, uh, answer when it comes to the strategic direction of this country because I think it's basically a tremendous strength that year after year you are seeing a reconfirmation of a wish to move Georgia closer to the European Union and something which is an asset for me in my everyday work and for my delegation. Uh, and I think it's not uh, misled in any way. I think it's a, a very conscious choice. And I'm absolutely convinced when it comes to, to those European values that uh, they are rather deeply ingrained already in the DNA of, of this country. Um, in fact, I mean, I was remembered, uh, reminded of the fact, uh, of this fact, uh, just when we had the last Independence Day. And you look at the, the constitution of the First Republic and you are flabbergasted at how visionary it was in terms of putting democracy, but also equality, very high on its agenda. And if you compare that constitution with any constitution in Europe at that time, I would say that Georgia was probably more advanced than uh, but definitely the majority of European states. So I would even say that these European values, they all spring from the same source and uh, Georgia has also been part in forming these values. And so I think the assumption of, of the population is the correct one and um, I think it is a strength um, that this conviction is so strong and it's something we need to, to work on together. If I may, on, on the issue of European values, uh, because sometimes um, there are those who try to portray European values, which is just a buzzword, as something more than what, what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about fundamentals such as democracy and human rights, respect for human rights, uh, what have you. Um, um, whereas it's not about uh, infringing on issues such as national identity issues. We're not talking about infringement on traditions, culture, alphabet, language, uh, whatever specificities uh, any country have. In fact, it's the reverse. If you look at the European Union, our motto is united in diversity, uh, and that is something that the European Union is also actively helping our member states and we're also trying to uh, to do our best to uh, to assist Georgia in really bringing out those aspects which makes your country unique and makes our 27 countries unique. So you have a, a common foundation but on that basis the diversity is really an asset um, and, uh, and, and that's how European values come into play and where European values are not related to these wider national identity issues. Thank you very much. And that's why I should say that uh, a pizza from Italy will always be the best one um, and a khachapuri from Georgia will always be the best. I hope. I hope. Thank you for your mission, for uh, your job in Georgia. We all see a lot of very important achievements. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, the big part of Georgian society uh, more and more actually will be involved in the same activities as economical or in other activities which gives them the feeling how closer we're becoming real members of European family. Thank you and wish you all the best in Georgia. Thank you so much, Georgi.